welcome to my talk. I'm Adrian. I work at uh, the University of Lisbon and I'm going to be talking about purely functional distributed programming for collaborative applications, which is a very long title. Sorry about that, but it's really saying what we're going to do. We're going to make a purely functional programming language for distributed applications and then see how we can make some collaborative applications in it. So you can tweet me or look me up on GitHub. And my work is supported by protocol apps. Okay. Um, so imagine writing this application. So imagine there's a kind of a base on Mars, and the people on Mars and Earth want to collaborate. So if you just imagine writing this application today, um, people familiar with distributed programming uh, will have a hard time imagining how that will be, how that might be done. So, why is that? Well, I'm going to say that there's not enough functional programming in distributed programming, and we'll see uh, how we can solve this problem later. So, uh, please ask questions because I'm going to be talking about weird stuff. And so if you don't understand anything, just stop me. Uh, I think there's enough time. So here's the thing, a very classic distributed program written in Erlang. I hope it's uh, written correctly. I haven't tested it. Um, so you've got this client process, which you launch, and which is defined by this function. And you've got the server process, which also has to be launched, and is defined by this function. And so. You've got these things here, which are the message sends and waiting to receive messages. And these are impure effects. And I think these are quite icky, because they don't compose. Like, you cannot take the server and put it in here, which is the representation of the server on the client. So can we do better than this? And I'm going to say yes, but we'll have to rethink what a distributed program is a little. So what are distributed programs about? You've got these places, so um, places in space, but you could also see your device as a place, or like your phone, your computer. And then there are moments in time. So the screen on your phone changes over time, right? You scroll, it changes. All right, so we could say that a distributed program is a function from space-time, so moments in space at a particular time, to some value, say the screen of your phone. <laughs> so a really simple program is just the temperature. So uh, everywhere there's a temperature and the temperature changes over time. I'm developing a programming model called relativistic functional reactive programming. So it's a bit more complicated than what I said before. But we've got these things called behaviors, which are functions from space-time to some value. And these are continuous, so there's a value uh, at every point in space and time for the behavior. And then we've got these events, and these are individual points in space and time. So you right now, for example. Um, so this is based on functional reactive programming. Uh, by Conal Elliott and Paul Ludek. Conal's sitting right there. And their model didn't have space-time, but just time. So this can only model a single place. And I'm just extending it to space-time, and we'll see what we can do with this. A distributed program is all about communication. And in this model, you didn't see anything about communication. So how does that happen? Well, imagine you being a single point in space, so you're just sitting there now, and your image is kind of traveling through the room in the form of light reflecting off you. And someone else sitting across the room, they can see you, and they are perceiving you a little bit in the past, a very short bit in the past, because light is very fast, but if you're very far away, then it will take a longer time for that light to come to you. So just imagine you like radiating outwards your present self. And we'll call this perception. So when one point in space-time kind of sees another, we don't say how, it's just like points in space-time travel out and their information about the point in space-time travels through space. 
and when another point in space-time perceives another, they know everything about that point in space-time. Say, for example, there's Paris at 5 p.m., and Paris has a little radio antenna on top of the Eiffel Tower, and it's raining and it's sending out the weather, and London receives it a minute later. <laughs> then London has perceived Paris a minute in the past, and Paris uh, knows that, oh, it's raining, so the ground must be wet. And London should also always be, be able to derive that the ground is wet when it knows that uh, it's raining in Paris. So this is to avoid uh, having to model the partial transmission of information in a distributed system, because that would get very complicated quickly. Um, yes, that's what I just said. And then, so we have perception, but it's not just perception. It should be kind of like an all-knowing, transitive perception of facts and derived facts. So transitive means that if one point in space-time perceives another, and this point in space-time in its turn had perceived another, this first point should know everything <coughs> about the last point because you kind of perceive everything there is to know about this point and also its past. So let's try to make a thin <laughs> program that we saw before in Erlang and write it using perception. So here's the client, it's like wondering, can you hear me? And it's hoping that the server will reply, yes, I can hear you. So this is a fact, this client is thinking I wanna reach the server and that's traveling to space and time and at some point it might reach a server and the server has perceived this fact. So the server has perceived, can you hear me? Then this fact travels to space and time and once again it might reach a client somehow and then the client has perceived the perceiving of its original intent. And you can go continue doing this. So if the server reaches, uh, knows about this fact again, it's perceived the perceiving of the perceiving of, can you hear me? So if you look at this and you know functional programming, you might say, oh, there's like this thing growing, 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 growing. Um, it kind of looks like how you might write an infinite list or something like this. And we usually write these things through recursion. So in relativistic functional reactive programming, you can use recursion over space and time to write programs like this. So uh, you've got this thing, uh, no, this can you hear me? So this original event and then you ask what are the perceptions at the server, and then the perceptions at the client, and then feed this back again into the perceptions at the server and perception at the client, and so on. So if you name all these events, so events at the client will be called C, one, two, three, four, five, and the server S1, S2, then you might say, can you hear me is an event with a single occurrence? C1 and ping will be an event with the occurrences C2, C3, C4. You might even write programs that do not talk about location at all. So if you think about what ping is, it's kind of like the perception of perceptions. So let's write this down. Pingish programs just perceive perceptions of perceptions of some initial event. If you think about what that might look like, it's going to get complicated quickly. So say you have three places and there's communication between the places, then this kind of explodes. But we might be able to write something like restrict pingish programs to those between client and server, and then only consider the events at the client. So then we'll get this path of communication between the client and server, and then the uh, events at the client will just be this. So um, any questions now about relativistic functional reactive programming? It's kind of a summary slide. Okay, so let's continue with our AstroDo app. So what's the fundamental problem here? Is that light takes at least four minutes and up to 20 minutes 
of time to travel between the Earth and Mars. So this is a problem for the way you, we usually write distributed programs because we usually assume there's this like a single place of truth, so the server usually, which is gonna say is what we can do in the application or what we can't do. And anyone interacting with the application has to talk to the server to do anything. So in this case, you might have to talk, like if you place your server in the middle between Earth and Mars, it will take at the minimum two, uh, four minutes to do any operation. So there's Earth and Mars, but the same thing applies to if you're kind of like a cyberpunky person and want to own your data and work on your own devices and have them synchronized, like you won't always be online, you will want to work offline. Um, like some devices might be connected, but then separated from the network, and then other mice devices might be connected among them. Uh, so this also applies to disaster zones, say you have like this mesh network, or you don't even have any network, and you still want to collaborate by like physically touching your phones and synchronizing the data. So this, uh, the field which tackles these problems is called strong eventual consistency. And what we're going to do is predictively uh, derive a result from known facts. So in this context, the facts are the operations performed in the application. So let's see what the known application uh, operation means. So that's just the ones you have perceived. So say you're this blue point in space and time, then the perceived operations are those. So say uh, somehow the operations travel like this to this point and then some other uh, point in space time travel to here. The perceived <laughs> operations are those which are like just before you, the ones that you have received but not yourself, right? Because your future self perceives your past self but your present self cannot perceive yourself right now. Okay. And so then we'll have to predictively, uh, predictably combine operations. Combining operations in functional programming is often called FOLD. And we'll make it predictable by using a commutative and associative combining function. This is basically saying that it doesn't matter in which order you perceive things. Uh, you should always derive the same result from the things you know about. So fold will get an initial value, you give it an event, and it will derive a behavior, which is always the combination of the things you know. So uh, fold plus over these event occurrences at the blue dot means take these event occurrences, which are like tagged with numbers, <laughs> say you're counting something and people are proposing numbers and you just want to know the sum of these numbers, then you'll just add up all of these, and get 3 plus 2 plus 2 is 5, and that's 12. So, um, let's look at AstroDo again, because it's way more complicated than just adding numbers. You have all these issues, such as you want to delete uh, to-do list items. You have this checkbox, which you can turn on or off. And then you even have a text field which you can edit. So anyone can edit at any time and somehow you have to reconcile the results. So let's look at this, the simplest problem here which is to tell whether an item is deleted or not. Um, so say we're talking about fixing the solar panels, the astronauts have decided okay we don't need to do that anymore ever again, we've got new technology which is self-cleaning so let's forget about it. So say um, some astronauts on Mars vote true and the people on Earth don't think the astronauts should be so wise and they will tell what the astronauts should do. So then the people on Earth vote false and the astronauts have voted true and we have to derive a result. So we'll just say that if there are multiple known opinions about deletion, we'll just let deleting win. So we'll combine using logical or. So um, true or true or false. Well, that's true. 
So we'll say that the item is deleted. These patterns where you combine operations in a predictable way to get a value, these are called conflict-free replicated data types. And these are very like uh, non-functional in their philosophy. But that's fine, we can kind of model them functionally in relativistic functional network programming. And we'll just say like a CRDT is of operations and values is an event from operations <coughs> to behavior of values. And the one we just saw, where you fold using OR, it's called the enable once flag, because on a flag you can say like, I want to enable the flag or I want to disable the flag. And once you know of an enable on the flag, uh, it will never get disabled again, it will just stay enabled. So that's what we were doing before with the delete button. All right, let's look at the little checkbox. So that one you can tick on or tick off. So it's a little more complicated because you cannot use uh, or to do this because once it's ticked on, it will always stay on. So how do we do this kind of overriding of decisions? Like we want to say, we know better than the past, please consider my opinion instead. Um, and a classic solution to this problem is say, we'll tag each uh, operation with a timestamp. And so you could like say, oh, there's some event on Mars and an event on Earth. And we have to derive a result. Well, we'll just say, okay, this date on Earth is better than the date on Mars, and have that win. And then the theory is that if something happens later, well, that will be greater than those previous things, so that will win instead. But the problem is, so this is called uh, last writer wins. And it's very problematic because you should not compare uh, time, like local time, on different points in space because these things are not comparable uh, if you know physics. I don't, but that's what people say. <laughs> <laughs> so instead we can do something a little more sensible, which is to use perception. So say that the true operation happened and information about the true operation uh, traveled somewhere, like here, and a little bit later, the false operation happens. So this false operation knows about the true operation. And then that false operation travels to us. So now we know about the true operation and the false operation. And we know that uh, false kind of happened after true because it knew about true. So we know for sure that it happened after. So we'll just derive false. So um, these uh, events like false there are called concurrent events in distributed programming. And these are the events that you know of, but which are not known about any other events that you also know of. So let's look at that. So you have this function which can express this concept. So it takes an event, produces a behavior of event. And so here's an event, and we'll ask and so it produces a behavior, so we can ask, what's your value at a particular point in space and time? So we'll ask, what's your value at the blue point in space time? So the result is that we only consider these two event occurrences, because this one knows about these two, and this one doesn't know about anyone else, but that's fine. No one else knows about this one, and we know about it, so we only consider these two. So another example, let's say you have this event, and we'll ask the value at the purple point in space and time. Then we only have one event to consider, because this uh, point in space time knew about all the previous ones. OK, so um, now we can do this checkbox thing and ask whether the solar panels need fixing and have this like turn on and off by just uh, first considering only the concurrent events, and then passing this to the enable once flag, which we already had. And it works fine, because the enable once flag works on events. And so here the result will be false, because this false knows about these true events. So uh, this weird thing is just like a combinator, which smushes behaviors together by taking like two behaviors at the same time. It's not uh, relevant now, but. So 
now we've got these two CRDTs, the enable once flag CRDT and the enable wins flag CRDT. And what's kind of uh, unique about this approach is that when you look at CRDT libraries, they implement all of these things from scratch every time. So every single CRDT is like this whole module written from scratch almost. But what's obvious here is that you should just be able to reuse existing CRDTs using operations like consider the concurrent events. Sorry uh, about this thing. Is it always easy to find situations where enable wins makes sense? And um, no, it, sometimes you have like um, also disable wins, for example. Like it just depends who, what you want to win. Like, uh, there are specific cases in which you want um, the kind of negative operation to take precedence. Or maybe you have to route the signal first to Mars, that Mars can make up his mind and then do things like this. Um, so that's something else because then you're waiting on the perception of Mars before you do something. So yeah. in this we don't consider problems like this, but you might write something like that. So let's see about this text field. So that's a bit more difficult because um, usually like uh, sequences in normal local computer programming are done like this. You just insert at the numeric index, like an absolute index. So say insert x at 10 and insert y at 10 afterwards or insert y at 10 and insert x afterwards. And the problem is that these are not commutative. The order matters. So if you do the first one, you'll get fixed solar xy panels. And if you do the second one, you get fixed solar yx panels. So now we're kind of violating the be predictable principle because people will have different results based on the order of perception or something like that. So how do we solve this? Well. We'll label every element in the sequence with an identifier and then just say insert something in between two identifiers. And if you do this in this case, which is kind of a lucky case, say insert x between 1 and 2 and insert y between 2 and 3, then there's only one way to derive this result no matter how you try to combine these operations. So then we get a, x, b, y, c. But you might ask, like, how did we get this ABC in the first place? And uh, what are these identifiers? How do we get them? So uh, ABC, we can make it by saying, like, there's a special start position and special end position. And we'll say A goes in between start and the end. So this is like someone typing ABC on their computer. And then the B goes between A and end and the C goes between B and the end. And what we have to do to turn this into a sequence is something called a topological sort. So it will sort this kind of graph in a way so that, that the relative uh, positions are preserved. So B will always come after A and C will always come after B. Okay. Then there's a problem when you insert something um, like this, so say you want to put A uh, before the start and before the end, and B also before the start and before the end, you kind of have a problem because it's no longer commutative again. You need like an ordering. And so that's done just by tie-breaking on the identifiers. So we'll just define a kind of total order on identifiers and use that for tie-breaking. So it's, this bit is still kind of not that predictable, but it's the best we can do. All right, so let's program sequences. First, um, so yeah, the sequence looks like this. So you have an event of operations which say insert some value between two positions, and out we get the behavior of identified values. So what's a position? Well. We said before there's a start, then there are the middle bits, which uh, use identifiers, and there's the end. And as 
uh, kind of our identifier tag, we'll just use points in space-time. So we'll define some order on points in space-time, which doesn't mean anything, but we'll just use it for tie-breaking. And in the context of the, uh, this event, these points in space-time are kind of unique because we defined it that way. So we'll just pretend we have this function, tag with space-time, which takes an event and tags it with the occurrences in, sp in space and time, uh, I mean with their points in space-time as like a value that we can hold. So let's see what it looks like to program this sequence. Um, first we use tag with space-time to get like the identified operations, and then we combine um, these operations into a big set, and we'll just call this the graph of like the way I showed it before. And we'll do that using uh, fold, using set union. So we start with the empty set, and then we put every uh, kind of operation in this set. And no matter how we do it, it will commute, it's all fine. And then we just map the topological sort over this behavior. So topological sort has this type, you get these identified uh, in between values, and out we get this sequence of values. So map E is just like map on lists, but for events, and map B is like map on behaviors, uh, map on lists for behaviors. So um, the sequence before, it didn't talk about deletion, but obviously if you press backspace on your little text field, the text should disappear. But that's not a problem because it's quite easy to model. <laughs> we just say that these A's here, they're actually also behaviors of like one of these uh, enable once flags. So they will, they will turn on once you press backspace after a certain uh, character. So we'll say it's deleted forever. And then, um, so your characters might be just like a char. Okay, and then we got we out we get this. So um, yeah, there should be parentheses here, but we'll get like a behavior that's a sequence of behaviors of whether something is deleted and the value at that position. And then we'll just have to filter out the deleted ones. And how we get like the behavior we had before, uh, before we knew about deletion. Okay, so now we've got all of the components of our astro do. There's this one thing, new task, which I skipped. But, um, can talk about that later. So this is kind of where I'm at. I can write applications like astro do. Um, they're a bit complicated right now because I don't have a good uh, like a graphical user interface library. So uh, the code is still quite short but quite messy because I'm, I have to integrate with some existing frameworks or uh, libraries to make it happen. Um, but I'm working on a library for Reflex which will implement this. And every existing Reflex program, so Reflex is an FRP library. It's kind of like the most industrial strength FRP library with a lot of optimizations and uh, used to actually make money, so it works. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm going to integrate it and I'm just going to implement eventually consistent RFRP as a library for Reflex and every existing Reflex program will also be an RFRP program. Because uh, you can kind of, the semantics, since they're very similar, they just work. So that's very handy because you can use all the functions defined in Reflex with your uh, distributed applications. And then there are some hard problems to solve. For example, uh, garbage collection. If you, like if you delete things in the, se in the sequence, right now these, it will be remembered forever, even though technically, uh, in certain cases, you can forget about stuff. But the, when this happens, it's kind of complicated, then it depends on like the semantics of the uh, enable once flag, so it depends on the semantics of your delete button and these kind of things. But it's, I think it's solvable, so that's what my PhD is about, like how to implement eventually consistent RFRP uh, effectively. <laughs> Um, 
So, um, kind of to summarize, relativistic function reactive programming is FRP extended to be about space time, so that you can consider places also with time. Um, to make these eventually consistent programs, all you need is this function, fold. To make them a little fancier, you can use concurrent two. But just with these two, you can write almost any interesting program that there is to write. And they basically, if you use these functions to write your program, you get these peer-to-peer -peer apps for free. Because they'll all keep working even though they're offline. They'll synchronize when you can talk to different instances of the app. Um, so that's really cool, and I would love to see people uh, develop with it. So keep a track of my GitHub, and eventually there will be a library there that you can use and make programs with. Thank you. Thank you, so there's plenty of times for questions. Yeah. Uh, you didn't address failure. I'm a little late, but failure is a very important topic. Yes. So I indeed do not address failure because, so in one sense, failure is fine because it just means something hasn't been perceived yet. Maybe it will be perceived later. But in other senses of failure, like. Um, the folks are con con combined facts from Mars and Earth and in that's, that's a lot of planet. Okay. Earth. And one of the planet is the people, another planet, but the people on that. So I no longer have those facts. I can't rely on that. I don't, like the solar panel up is up on Saturn or whatever. So now Saturn disappears. Why should I keep this in my knowledge base? Yeah, uh, actually, with, with all right. that, with, with yeah. that knowledge and, and say, hey, what's happening? So here? that's one of those garbage collection problems which mm. you're it's trying to forget about Saturn, I think. No, the problem is a problem of resources, you just map it immediately to God reflection. Right, so okay. Just think, yes. we, tend to, we tend to throw solutions that we know at problems that maybe are not the right ones. Right, yeah. Uh, I just haven't thought about much about how that would work. Okay. I just assume there's like infinite memory and we <laughs> can <laughs> keep going. Yeah, but eventually that. there should be uh, solutions to this. So. Um, yeah, I talked with Tonal about one possible solution, so, um, right. um, okay, so say you've got this kind of sensor uh, that's measuring the temperature and you're doing IoT things. So a kind of uh, weird thing to, with IoT is you have to decide how much information you're going to send. But we know we can model the temperature here as a continuous function because it is. There's always a temperature. And I think if you kind of add probability in there, so you add like a probability distribution which describes how temperatures are or how to interpolate between temperatures, you might solve problems like back pressure because you can kind of decide like, is my temperature precise enough? And then tell the sensor to stop sending so, many, so much data. And so this is one way to solve certain kinds of failure in distributed programs in this model. More questions, yeah. Um, I have actually two questions. <coughs> the first question is more on a conceptual level. Um, you, you basically take the typical CRT causality structure as a space time. But um, space time actually is like um, it has a certain curvature and in physics it has kind of a meaning. So do you also see that one could extract, for example, um, and, and learn the distances of the structure? So in, in this case, something that I think might be helpful is actually for the algorithms to expose the distances that are there in the system instead yeah. of just hiding them completely away. Yeah, um, that's a very cool idea, and I think it's indeed kind of possible. So it would be like yeah you would have to add more information about what you know about the world in this model, and then some runtime executing the program might use this to do useful things. But, yeah, it's a good idea to... Yeah. Sure, go ahead, thanks. 
Um, so I've actually worked on the CRDT library, um, and I, I know quite a few of the people involved uh, um, in the Litecoin project. Um, so one thing that all these, you, you mentioned that this is kind of ugly in the way that the data types are actually built, like more than more like distributed objects, yes. interfaces, mutable references, and so on. But one thing that the implementations often need to do is to lay out the metadata in a way that is sufficiently um, um, mergeable with these this com combinators that you have described. Mm -hmm. So do you do you plan to, or do your combinators actually, are, are they equally efficient in that they can look up um, um, the causality structure? Yes, so if you make your fold a bit more complicated, so you have to know whether things are just a lattice or just kind of like a commutative uh, monoid or maybe something else, then there are like different cases of how you implement these efficiently. And concurrent is always implemented the same. So we've got kind of like the best implementation for concurrent. Um, so yeah, so these actual implementations of CRDTs, they relate uh, precisely to what, you, what <coughs> you're writing here, if you've added enough information to your program. But yeah. I think maybe you might have to be a bit smart to compile it in such a way, but it should be possible because the information is there. Yeah. Uh, can you go, go back to the slide where you um, insert into the sentence? Okay. So one of these. Um, so what ha would happen if first set is a x between one and two, and first set is a y between between one and two? So that would be uh, some kind of conflict, because um, right. So that's what I was trying to explain. But so what you would do is basically invent identifiers out of thin air or something, and just ensure that they're ordered. And so if you insert x between a and b and y between a and b, you'll just say, oh, the identifier associated with x is uh, higher, and we'll make it come first. And then so it will read x, uh, y, b, c. But doesn't that mean that um, order of events is, uh, is relevant again? Because <laughs> so yeah, yeah so it means that ranks. there's a relevant order on events, yes. but it's kind of arbitrary, but at least it's consistent. So if three people edit uh, in this way, <coughs> they're uh, usually it's so associated with like a identifier for the device or something like this, it will always consistently appear in the same <coughs> relative position to, uh, compared to the others. Sorry, I think, well, yeah. first you and then. Uh, Sorry, my mistake. Right. No, no, no problem, go ahead. I, I think I still don't quite get that, right? Because to determine the identifiers for each letter, mm -hmm. would you need some sort of like input into an identifier function, like the position of the letters or something? And then it, it's kind of like a self referential problem, right? To determine which identifier is the ones up uh, here? Yeah. Or yeah, like, like the, the one and the two and the three, yes. or A, B, C. Like, how could you generate those numbers? So you have to generate them here at the same time of insertion. But uh, basically, it could just be like uh, Adrian 1, Adrian 2, Adrian 3. Because I know, like, say Adrian is unique in the world. That's fine. Now I just need to distinguish between my events so I can just locally look at what was my last event's number and add one to that number. And then you can have kind of globally unique identifiers. Oh, so, you can you get public consistency levels? Kind of strong version of consistency? Um, I assume so. So I guess you could just execute these programs using weak consistency. What, what, what Maybe not. It wouldn't make so much sense to use concurrent in that case. But I don't know if you. Yeah, I don't know if you can implement concurrent efficiently in that case, but um, yeah, 
Yeah, in a sense, you could execute them using some weak consistency level, but then obviously your programs won't make so much sense anymore. What was strong enough, like in randomness? That's all fine. I, that, I think you can go stronger than strong eventual consistency, and it will just keep working. Like, because you can execute this program locally on your computer, and it will do useful things. And that's kind of the strongest level of consistency that we can have. Yeah, there was one question. Yeah. I quite understand the question. If you, if I have an insert on Mars and um, two concurrent inserts, mm -hmm. and um, I want the order to be consistent, consistent on Mars and on Earth. Yes. So it's true that you need to kind of send all the data, all the facts to both places, in the end, that's what you want to do. But there's no need for like synchronizing at every step, because uh, the way we've written these applications, it just happens that if you use these functions, you will get the same thing on the screen. So, um, yeah, there's no, if you write applications like this, there's no need for this strong synchronization concept. So you could plug this in and have your programs be provably correct, not just like assume that we're telling the truth about our commutativity. Good. No more questions? Or, uh, okay. I mean, we still have some time, but good. Okay. Thank you. Thank Ryan. you.